Welcome, everybody, to the Engadget Show, brought to you by AT&T, whose 4G LTE is up to 10 times faster than 3G. We have an amazing Engadget Show for you tonight. We're going to go to Barcelona to Mobile World Congress to take a look at all the amazing phones at one of the biggest conferences of the year. We're going to be talking to Sony Electronics president Phil Molyneux about the future of television. We're going to go to iRobot to take a look at some of their new military robots that you can throw through windows. But first, we have a head-to-head -head competition in the desert on the danger zone. We're coming to you from the future, a desert wasteland caused by mankind's own excesses. Actually, that's not true. We are in the desert, but we're just a couple of miles outside of Las Vegas, and I am wearing a helmet, as you might have noticed, for good reason. We're here to test out two of the best helmet cameras that you can buy. My right hand, the Contour Plus. My left hand, the HD Hero 2 from GoPro. Both are 1080p, both are really high quality, and both will capture your extreme sport activities in higher depth than you can you imagine. You got tackled or what? Let's test them out. No, forward, you're supposed I to go know, forward. I just... Go, go. <laughs> so, Mr. Heater, where are we today? We are in uh, somewhere outside of Las Vegas. This is, I think, where they bury the bodies. No, it's where they bury the ET cartridges. Yeah, I mean, that explains all the bumps in the road, yeah. honestly. You know the specifics on this guy? Talk about the what? The vehicle. Oh. The so Polaris. we are in a Polaris Razor. That's RZR, not RAZR. No valves whatsoever. This is the thinnest four-wheel drive vehicle <laughs> you can buy. This is an 800cc unit, and uh, it's pretty capable, I gotta say. How, how do you, how's the handling, Brian? Um, I'm gonna say, you know, the, the steering wheel's a little bit looser than I'm used to, but I think that might be common. It's also twisted to the left 30 degrees when you go yeah. straight ahead, which is a bit of an annoyance. I, I really, I, I mean, honestly, I don't have a lot to compare it to. Uh, you know, compared to my Ford Taurus station wagon, this thing handles pretty well. Now, if you're gonna wanna take the kids to the pool, you're gonna want something like a Ford Taurus station wagon with all that roomy interior. That is some expert analysis that you can only get here on the Engadget Show. And we're going up! We're going up, and then we're gonna go back down again, so. But up here on the right, we've got the HD Hero 2 from GoPro. This is their latest and highest quality model, the 1080p. It's also got uh, line in for audio, which is nice, and, and, we, and a mini got... HDMI out. Now the competition <laughs> is the Contour Plus, which is uh, directly above Brian's head at the moment. You'll see my head hitting it in a second. Yes. The Contour Plus is also a 1080p camera, and it also has audio line in, and it also has a mini HDMI out. Both of the two are 170 degree wide angle cameras. <laughs> Both are 100 and, oh God, 170 degree wide angle cameras. But when you bring the contour up to, oh, to 1080p, it actually narrows down a little bit to 125 degrees. The uh, GoPro, the HD Hero 2, stays at 170 degrees even at 1080p, which is, uh, which is a, a, a bonus for the GoPro. But the Contour has a couple of advantages of its own. Probably the biggest is... It's that sexier. It's, it is sexier, yeah. I think that's probably very easy to see. The Contour model is much slimmer and much more discreet not that, than the GoPro. Not that big things can't be sexy, too. This is true. Well, the a Contour Plus life. here has Bluetooth built in. And you can pair it up with your smartphone, Android or iPhone, or an iPod Touch even. And you can use your phone as a viewfinder, which is pretty awesome. Assuming you want to bring your phone out into a setting Yeah, like today this. we decided to leave our phones back in the car. That's but not true, I actually If took you're mine. in a slightly less sandy environment, uh, you can use your phone to make sure that you're pointed in the right direction, which is pretty cool, because the one problem with helmet cams is that it's really tough, tough to tell where they're pointing, because, you know, you can't look through a viewfinder or anything. Yeah. So that's cool on the contour. Oh boy, I see a lot of dudes. Oh, oh yeah! That is where my stomach leaves my body and drains out of my eyeballs. Oh. 
that wind is horrible. All right, on the left, we've got the Contour Plus footage. See, the color is a little bit blue yeah. here. Uh, it's set on auto color, but it's definitely not reading the conditions right. It's so it's a it little bit cool. This doesn't look like the, the scenery. That we're no, here. not as yellowish as the real dirt. But the the quality is good. 1080p footage looks great. Um, a lot of good detail. Uh, so no no complaints there. Let's go ahead and look at the GoPro footage. You can tell immediately that yeah. the color is much much better. It's a more natural shot. Yeah, definitely better. The wider angle lens, you can see, is 170 degrees, so you're getting more of the surroundings, but you're also getting a lot more distortion, too. I've had enough of this sand, Brian. How about you? Yeah, I'm wondering if there's a way we can get uh, above it. Driving around the desert was fun, but I've got a need for more speed, and we're going to take care of that. We're at Sky Combat Ace, just outside of Las Vegas. We've got two helmet cams. We've got two stunt planes waiting for us to match. We're going to go up in the air. You and I are going to dogfight. I've got a need, a need for a vomit bag. Let's go get through our training and let's get up in the air. All right, gentlemen, welcome to Sky Combat Ace. We're going to be Ace One flight today, and we're going out on our adrenaline rush mission, which includes air to air combat, some aerobatics, and some air to ground combat as well. You guys are going to be our combat wingmen for the day. In order to do that, you're going to have to have fighter pilot call signs. But you are not allowed to choose it for yourself. Mm. It has to be chosen for you by someone else. I think I'm going to give you toxic because once we start yanking and banking up there, I think what's going to be coming out of your mouth is going to be rather toxic. I'm going to, I'm going to pick dead eye because you just said yanking and banking with a straight face. All right, Toxic, we've got a couple of capable pilots here to help us out. I've got Stroke on my end, you've got Hollywood on yours. Are you ready to roll? I mean, if I say no now, does it change anything? It absolutely doesn't change a thing. All right, let's get our parachutes on and let's get up in the air then. We need some parachutes? I hope we don't need them, but we should have them just in case. Back on the ground, we've made it safe, thanks to you, sir. That was a great time, it was amazing, thank you. It was a lot of fun, you guys did great. Awesome, which would you say of the two of us would be the, uh, the better combat pilot up there? Well, of the two of you, the better combat pilot, I'm gonna have to go with... By gallon? Well, oh yeah, by, by sheer volume of, you know, yeah, that would be you. <laughs> yep. But we did have two combat engagements, you each won one of them, gunning the other, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm gonna have to call that a tie. All right, I'll take that. Thanks again, Stuart. Sure. Amazing. Very welcome. I washed my hands, don't worry. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> See you guys. All right, so we're going to talk about these I guys. I forgot why we did this in the first place. Yeah, it was, well, it was kind of out of your line of sight right there yeah, in the forehead the whole time. Yeah, well, that was, you know, honestly, that was one of the hardest parts of the whole thing was um, trying to keep my head trained on you mm -hmm. with, like, all the G-force happening around my uh, my weak neck muscles. Yeah, and I think it's also a little hard to tell if that thing is actually operational. You can't really tell if it's recording. Yeah. There's a tiny little beep when you turn it on, but 
it's, it's got. The, I mean, there's an. We didn't use it, but there's an LCD. I mean, it's not much right. use when it's on your forehead. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing that I, I still like better about the contour. You always know exactly when it's recording. You flip that thing forward, yeah. it starts. You flip it back, it stops. Even if you're wearing gloves, you can always tell where it is. So if we're talking a helmet mount, I think this is my preferred camera. I mean, for that's that just a better alone. fit for your head. It definitely this looks like nicer. A, a miner's light. On yeah, your forehead. or a toaster on your head, or yeah. something like that. But you know, if we're talking about mounting it on the wing, which we did as well, I think that the the GoPro sure. gives a little bit better quality, and uh, it's um, it's a nice little camera as well. That's so. What, how much does the suction cup add on? Because that to me is the most amazing thing of this whole thing is that we shoved it on the side of the wing. Absolutely, yeah. Suction cups are not that much less yeah. than uh, less than fifty bucks to get one of those, and yeah, you can take it up to a couple hundred miles an hour on a plane. So uh, no clear winner here, but uh, two great cameras, uh, regardless of what you need to do, you can yeah. now film it and make sure that your moment of infamy is captured in 1080p for all of your friends there, to there see. There was a clear loser today. Yeah, who would that be? My turkey sandwich. Oh, spare a moment for Brian. Here's lunch. So one of you is going to go home with my doggy bag <laughs> today. Which is not full of a sandwich, I would like no. to say. Uh, I, I, I think it's safe to say that we both uh, lost our lunch while we were up there. They, there wasn't all the aerobatics that we did. We did loops. We did uh, yeah. some combat. We did four You held down a little, a little longer than I did. I vomited less than you did, but ultimately we both... Ultimately, these it. held out longer than these both, both did really here. well. Uh, so this is again, uh, this is the Contour Plus. This is the top of the line model from Contour, 1080p, 170 degree widescreen. That is the HD Hero 2 from GoPro, which is, again, their top-of-the-line model, 1080p, 170-degree yeah. widescreen. Very different designs, as you can see. This guy is much more discreet. You wear it on the side of your helmet like this. Well, it's also it's also just discreet as a standalone, too. Right. Like, if you, if you want to waterproof this guy, if you want to keep... I don't know if there's, like, 50-mile-an-hour dust storms around and you want to keep those out of your camera. <laughs> Not every day, but we managed to find one. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to have to strap this thing in a big... You're going to have to encase it in plastic. Right. This guy is not waterproof uh, either, which is a bit unfortunate. It's not sandproof. I mean, it didn't... It worked fine in the desert, but the switch here is a little bit crunchy now. Yeah, we didn't... Sand. We haven't cleaned it up. I mean, that's part... We have That's the thing, is somebody's going to walk away with this today and you're going to get a little bit of uh, Nevada sand in there. Yes. Both of these we're going to give away at the end of the segment, so get ready for that. Uh, this guy has some other neat tricks we didn't get a chance to play with in the segment. GPS built mm -hmm. in, so it'll track where you are, how fast you're going. It's also got Bluetooth built in. It'll sync to your phone, so you can use your phone as a viewfinder, so you can tell if it's ang angled the right way, and you can actually rotate this as well, so it doesn't matter how you mount it, you can always get upright yeah. footage, which is pretty cool. I mean, there's just a lot more functionality in that guy, but it's going to cost you a little bit more money if yeah. you go for the uh, the top of the line. This version. guy's $4.99, which is not cheap. That guy's $2.99, which is a bit better. But yep. Contour does make a cheaper model, which I happen to have right here. This is called the Rome. Oh, it's beeping at me. Uh, this is it's still beeping at me. This is uh, got basically all the same optics, still 1080p, 170 degree uh, wide angle view screen. But it special loses beeping functionality. special beeping, lots of beeping. Uh, has no Bluetooth, no GPS, but a lot cheaper, 200 bucks cheaper. Yeah, um, a couple of the other things too. I mean, if if you're going 1080p on that, you're going to lose a lot of the peripheral right. vision as well. Right. Um, and, and then, as as we said in the video, the color is just better. Definitely, on this the guy. color reproduction is better on that guy. So, I mean, it's hard to hard to pick a clear winner here. If you're going to be wearing it on a helmet, though, I still think this is the best choice because it just looks much more discreet on the side of your helmet yep. versus that guy strapped on your forehead. Both vomit proof. Very vomit proof, as we proved. And with that in mind, let's give these guys away. Yes, uh, we've got uh, we got some tickets we're going to give away. Yeah, I believe uh, Mr. Turi, would you like to come on on? Get your, yeah, get the wrap. This is John Turi, everybody. He Yay! Is, yes, thank you, John, hey, John. Keep still running. We've got two tickets okay. already. Two tickets you to, to GoPro one? Paradise. Two tickets to Paradise on the highway to Danger. Uh, the three eighty eight. Three eighty eight. Oh, way hey. in the back. All right, okay. come on up. I, I was just going to huck it at her. I don't think uh, you better get a little closer before okay. you throw it that far. All right. Yes. All right. Very durable. We'll take her cameras. word for it that that was her ticket. <laughs> the 274378 is the winner of the Contour Plus. Right here in the front. Hey. Yes. Can you catch a helmet camera? <laughs> what is your favorite extreme sport? <laughs> extreme scarf buying. All right. Okay. We have some other accessories for those we'll give you later. So enjoy your new helmet cameras. Everybody. I know we did. We certainly did. <laughs>
All right, let's take it down a notch. Uh, we had the opportunity to sit down with Sony Electronics president Phil Molyneux. Not to be confused with Peter Molyneux. No, not of the Super Molyneux brothers. Uh, sure, the Molyneux dynasty. Yes, Sony. he'll be talking about the future of television with our own esteemed Richard Lawler. So with that in mind, let's go to the interview. Hi, I'm Richard Lawler from Engadget, and we're here with President and COO of Sony Electronics, Phil Molyneux, to talk about the company's new TVs and TVs that are coming up in the future. Phil, thanks for joining us. Nice to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Jumping right into the future of TVs, Sony has been out front with their OLED products. You had the XEL1, which was one of the first TVs that came out with that technology, also the head-mounted display that came out over the holiday period. Correct. But at CES, we were really blown away by your new crystal LED prototype. Can you talk about why you guys chose to highlight that technology and what that could mean for your future displays? As you mentioned, we showed uh, OLED technology very early on. Um, but at this past CES, we showed the crystal LED and, and we had so many comments about the quality of the picture and the uniqueness of the technology. We're excited by the prospects of that technology, but we're in exploration mode. Um, and, you know, not quite decided whether we take it to market as yet. A little bit more time is needed, but it's promising. And we've seen your, your concepts before. We saw the head-mounted display as a concept, and then that yeah. came out. What, what has the reaction been to that, um, you know, with, with the helmet, and where do you see that going in the future? It's a very immersive uh, experience. You know, consumers put this head-mounted display on, and they've got 3D there or 2D uh, visuals right there, and it uh, appears like a 70-inch screen just in front of you, uh, together with stereo sound. A real unique product and, and the feedback from the consumer is extremely positive. And now we're moving into the second generation of the Google TVs. Uh, Sony was out front with the displays, the Blu-ray players. Um, we saw the new devices at CES. We have the new remote right yeah. here. How do you see that progressing? How do you see that technology being integrated with what Sony already does well? And what, what can you do to make Google TV better this time around? We work very closely with Google and we brought the first TV uh, powered by Google out to market back in October uh, and that went very well. At CES we've, we've announced a new line of Blu-ray players that are running on the Google platform but we've taken the experience to, to the next level. This is the controller for the Blu-ray players and first of all you can see you have a keypad here it's backlit yeah. uh, so very easy to navigate and move around. Um, some other unique features on here you have a trackpad, so the interaction for the consumer on how to drive menus or get through to where they want to get through uh, in that Google environment, it's much easier. It's got voice control within this box, which is very unique, but this is very neat. It also has a three-dimensional axle in here, so if you're on your Google TV um, powered by our boxes, then you can play a game and, and move around like this and use it as the controller. As far as your new products for 2012, the new line, what technology do you think will make the Sony displays this, this year stick out on the shelf from you know, all the other flat screen TVs that are rolling out? We have uh, some very unique technology within our TVs, uh, X-Reality uh, and X-Reality Pro. They allow upscaling of internet content. Mm -hmm. So when you're taking content from the internet, you know, wherever it may be, you're going to have a much more delightful experience with a Sony Bravia TV. Definitely. We've got the 3D TVs that are coming out. Yeah. That's much across more of the line this year. How is that progressing? How has that come from last year when, and when it was introduced before? Yeah. And how do you see it progressing over the next year or so? 3D has been a great success. If, if we look from uh, you know, theatrical re releases globally, um, around six billion US dollars in revenue, from consumers going to see 3D movies at the, at the theatre. TV, 3D has gone up exponentially. Uh, it's a feature in the majority of our uh, mid-range to high-end products. So I, I, I see that trend continuing uh, and expanding very quickly. You guys just introduced the new 4K projector. Yeah. Do you think that that's a technology that is possible for, for most people? Is it just going to remain at the, the more the ultra high end for now, or, or where, does, where does that really come in in the future? We have put 4K upscaling in uh, selected high end Blu-ray players. In the future when the 4K content is available, um, or even if it's 2, 2K or, or normal based HD technology, we'll be able to up, upscale to 4K. So we're driving that forward. 
and that will be another delightful experience for consumers in the not too distant future. Thanks for joining us, Phil. My pleasure. The amazing, the esteemed Richard Lawler. Yeah, and for all of Sony's hard work, we have absolutely no Sony products on this table. Sorry, Sony. Uh, but uh, we are going to be going over the best gadgets of the month, and there will be a quiz at the end, so pay attention to everything that we say. What's that, Brian? It looks like a lipstick stick of lipstick. This is a lipstick camera with absolutely no lipstick functionality inside of it. <laughs> uh, it actually doesn't have a lot of functionality at all inside of it. Which but is we're going to show you the one thing that it does really well. This is the Lytro camera, which is made by a company that's also called, called, Lytro. called Lytro. And uh, it's a very interesting camera. Obviously, it's very interesting looking. They designed it intentionally to not look like a traditional camera. This can take a picture at every focal length in one shot, so you don't have to focus, you don't have to worry about getting your picture composed right, you just take that picture and it automatically gives you the ability to dynamically change the focus after it's been captured. So that's really cool, it does that really well. Let's talk about all the things it doesn't do very well. <laughs> that list is a lot longer. Yeah, it has no optical zoom, which is a bit unfortunate. Pictures are low resolution. They don't like to talk megapixels because it's a whole new paradigm, of course, and we're talking about a whole new thing, but it's safe to say that they're fairly low resolution pictures. They're also perfectly square pictures, which is different than normal. And the software that we're using to download these pictures will only run on a Mac. That's true, it's only OS, which is, initially I thought, oh, well, you know, that sort of makes sense because a lot of photography professionals are using Apples, but this is not, if you're a photography professional, you're probably not gonna be using this thing out in the field. Right. You can't zoom in and out, right. it doesn't have flash on it. The cool thing about this is that you can do that focal trick I was talking about, but it really doesn't do anything else better than any other camera on the market. And it costs a lot more than every other camera. Yeah. Not every other camera. It's $400 anyway, which is a lot for a toy, which is effectively what this is. I mean, this is purely speculation, but we just sort of assume that this is kind of a proof of concept for the technology. Right. Uh, they brought this out to show that really cool one really cool trick that it can do. Should we show the one cool trick? Uh, it's still those wheels are we still spinning. You want to do this right. guy right here? All right. So we took this picture uh, of the, some of the that. devices we have uh, laid here, and what you can do is click on the picture and it will refocus. So the pen is blurry. Click on the pen. Super sharp. Pen is in focus now. If you click back in the background, now the tablet and is in focus. Can we That's get, a pretty is it going trick. Up? Yep. Yes, oh my God. Hand applause for the, the one thing that this does really well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a really cool trick, but of course you can't print that picture. You can't print something yeah. to tap on it. You can embed it into your website if you want to, which is kind of neat. With their like proprietary player, right? Right, but you can't you know, take this to grandma's house really and show it very easily or email that to grandma's so necessarily. So look for this in your 41 megapixel Nokia yeah, phone, right? I mean, the hope is that we can have this embedded in a smartphone someday in the future because, you know, on a phone it's hard to pick out what you want to focus on. A camera's in phones aren't very good at figuring out what they should focus on. With this, you don't have to worry about that. This is also a really crummy, tiny LCD. Tiny on the back little one-inch LCD yeah. there too. Oh. So that's the light. It's, yeah. it's cool, but um, let me get a shot of me just like casually throwing it behind me because I'm so sick of it. <laughs> now this is a tablet by Samsung with a 10.1 inch. Oh, I gave away the secret. With a 10.1 inch display on the front. The secret is that it comes uh, by art drawn by a chicken. But this is <laughs> this is uh, this is not a Galaxy Tab. This is a Galaxy Note. Yes, this, remember that really big phone? This is like the tablet version of that really big <laughs> that phone. That you cannot make phone yeah, calls on Yeah, you can't make phone this calls This is on. a prototype version that was flown uh, by hand by Ron Zach Honig straight out of, of Korea for all of you here tonight to see. So it's not final, I mean, no, it's still kind of a little bit it's, wonky right now. The stylus is not particularly responsive. <laughs> Excuse me, not the stylus. The S Pen. The S Pen, the Samsung does not appreciate it when you call it a stylus. This is the S Pen. Unfortunately, let me see if it's... <laughs> yeah, there, okay, we, there go. we go. All okay, right. sort of working. This is, you uh, have to have a beard. It only works yes, if you have a beard. Yes. It's kinetic uh, energy. It's kind of, especially in Korea, that's a bit of a restriction. Yeah. Uh, so this is, like I said, a very early prototype, so don't hold it against it. But uh, this is what's next for the Note line, effectively. No phone, but, uh, but much better. So this is the coolest 10-inch tablet on the market right now, right? Or that's coming out? Uh, well, I mean, if, what, if you want what one other, running, what other company if you want could, one that's running I mean, is Android. there any other company producing a roughly 10 inch tablet? There question. are, but if you want an ice cream sandwich, ice cream sandwich, this is the one, Okay, maybe for the future. But what if, I right don't know, now, what if say you, uh, what if say there was another mobile operating system? Oh, something that's, uh, oh my God. What? Apple on the back. Uh, this, so weird. This is it. I was it, just thinking about that and then it it's appeared. shocking. This is it. This is the new iPad, which is called the, the new, new iPad. <laughs> uh, this is what uh, uh, Apple has unveiled for you this morning. Okay, so it's uh, got stylus functionality. No, no that's stylus the number one new feature. 
This, is, as you can see, it's uh, got the same aluminum back as the iPad 2. It looks very much like the iPad 2. It's a little six, bit thicker. Six tenths of a millimeter thicker. A little couple, heavier. A couple grams thicker. So there's a little bit of a difference when you're holding it, but if you're not holding the two side by side, you really can't tell the difference. But the big difference is up front here, the new Retina display, much higher yeah. resolution, four times the resolution of the previous iPad. Turn the resolution down on your TV because it might explode. Because yes. that's how many pixels yes. are Stand on back, this thing. everybody. Uh, so these are 1080p TVs. They're gigantic around us. This guy has one million more pixels than, <laughs> than these TVs behind us, which is kind of outrageous. Uh, it also has LTE wireless built in on both Verizon and AT&T in the U.S., Rogers in Canada, and a couple of others internationally. So, Tim, if you put LTE on a tablet, the battery life must be terrible, right? I'm glad you asked, Brian, because the iPad 2 actually comes with a much larger battery, 42 and a half watt hours of battery life versus 25, so almost twice as much battery life. I mean, considering it's only a little bit thicker, that's, that's pretty impressive. Pretty good. Pretty how, good. Much, how much is one of these things going to run? Same with? price as the iPad 2 was, starting at $499 for the 16 gig and going up 100 bucks for each uh, increment, 32 gigs and then 64 gigs. But what if, I, what if that's too much resolution and I still want to buy another <laughs> pad with slightly less resolution? Wow, you're covered like there too. Four times less resolution. Uh, Apple is keeping the older iPad 2 around, so you can still buy the original iPad if you like to, excuse me, the second iPad if you like to, for $100 cheaper but it won't give you this amazing clarity, amazing resolution. It's not just uh, the, the resolution, it's the clarity, the gamut. Uh, it looks, this is a picture by uh, our managing editor, Darren Murph. This is where he went on vacation, by the way. So if you want to feel jealous about somebody, feel jealous about Darren Murph. Um, looks absolutely amazing. You won't see yeah. that on the iPad, too. Is it a worth the 100 bucks difference? I think it absolutely is. But, I mean, if you're looking for a cheaper iPad, if, say, you want to put your uh, iBooks on there, your textbooks, something to bring into the classroom, you maybe could. the iPad, too, is a good But at 16 gigs, you're not going to put many textbooks on there. So she's a rough mistress. It is, yes, she is. But, man, look at these pictures. I mean, this is just absolutely amazing. This is the best display on a mobile device we've ever seen before. And I hate to be hyperbolic, but uh, that is... Would you go so far as to call it resolutionary? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I would Is that not. the worst thing Apple's ever done, is come up with that little portmanteau? <sighs> Possibly. Top five. I'd, I'd say so. Like Pippin resolutionary. All right, so we've got another device sitting up here. This is not a device that's the top gadget of the month. This is actually one of our top gadgets of last year. Are you ready to unveil this guy? Sure. This Let's is the it. Transformer Prime from Asus. This is another very nice 10 inch tablet. And we're going to give this guy away. Oh my God. Now, remember when we told you to pay attention because we're going to be doing a pop quiz? Well, it's time for the pop quiz. We've picked three of you earlier, so come on up, folks. We're going to ask some questions. They just right. happen to be sitting in the front. Is wow, that that's very an convenient. amazing coincidence. Take a step to my left. Now, you've all got notepads mm -hmm. in front of you. I'm sorry that we couldn't afford to get notes from Samsung for each of you, but uh, you have to do with old pen and paper. So I'm going to ask you a question. Write down your answer. Try not to cheat if possible. Uh, first person to three correct wins uh, if we have a tie. Uh, then one of you gets the keyboard, and the other one gets the, the tablet portion. That's, that's fair. Uh, <laughs> or arm wrestling. Well, we can try that, too. Right, is everybody ready? Do you understand the rules? Because this is live and we can't do it over again. <laughs> okay. Ready? How many times greater is the resolution of the new iPad than of the iPad 2? Do they get, do they win anything for speed? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. All right. Everybody ready? Reveal your answers. The correct answer is four. Were you yeah. cheating? Oh, we have cheat activations on, of cheating. Uh, just for all the students out there, cheat off a smart guy. Yes. <laughs> Lesson learned. Make sure you cheat off the right guy. All right, we've got one point. I mean, in his defense, he's wearing glasses, so I could see how he got tripped up there. <laughs> Your oh, turn, yeah. Sir. You've uh, got okay. Question. Everybody ready? Sure. What, what, what is the, na what is the uh, Samsung's uh, name for the proprietary stylus that comes? Ah! It's with the Galaxy Note. Everybody ready? Okay, let's see it. All right, everybody got that. He got the punctuation right. He did, but uh, I don't think we give bonus points. So everybody's right, so we've got two points to you, one point to everybody else. Are we ready? Okay, next question. What operating system does the Lytro currently support? What desktop operating system does the Lytro currently support? It's speed just it doesn't count. Legibility, on the other hand, <laughs> is very important. All right, let's All right. see it. Everybody right. got OS X to some variation, which I think means we have a winner, right? Yeah. First to three. Congratulations. 
Thank you. We're going to send it home with not this one. This will not be the Transformer Prime, but we'll, we'll, we'll hold it like this and just pretend that this is the one. You, the one that you get is actually shrink wrapped, which makes it even more impressive. I, we so. could give him the one with all of your, uh, with your inbox on it. He did just won, he won so fast. Man, I, I need some help in my inbox, so if you want to take it, feel free. All right, congratulations, six guys, for playing. Sorry, you don't, oh, we don't have enough tablets for everybody, but bravo to you all. We'll give you that later. And now, I think it's time to make a trip to a little bit to the northeast, a little further northeast, right? We're going to go... We're going to uh, Boston-ish. You went to Boston. Yeah. You what, left me we're, We checked out, uh, that's true, you had to cover the Apple event. Yeah, sorry, I was busy. It's, uh, it's hard being the editor-in-chief. It is. I, on the other hand, went to Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, we went to the headquarters of iRobot. We checked out some consumer robots, some battle robots. It was awesome. Come along and join me, I suppose. <laughs> Hey, it's Brian Eater with Engadget. Uh, we are here in Bedford, Massachusetts, outside the iRobot headquarters. We're going to talk to some engineers. We're also going to take a look at the First Look robot, which is a robot that you can throw through a window. It's going to be great. And uh, we're going to get a sneak peek of the new Scuba Bot. Check it out. iRobot was founded gosh, way over uh, 20 years ago, and really was a spin out from MIT. Early on, the company spent a lot of its time doing paid research for the government and other industries, and over time, it's actually developed into a product company. A great example is First Look, which is our new five-pound robot that we're targeting at the military. So this is the 110 First Look. It's a, it's a small, extremely rugged robot, weighs about five pounds. Uh, that means, among other things, that you can actually throw it in the air. What are the ranges on these devices? They can be used for several hundred meters away from the operator. This is the most rugged robot you're going to see. Uh, it's got cameras all around it. We've got ones on the, uh, on the front and on the rear, and one on each side. So you can monitor all of that on this little remote control device right here. These are the wings. These will actually help the robot right if it falls over in the line of duty. Working with the military is extremely rewarding but also challenging. When a soldier gets out into the field, Afghanistan, Iraq, or wherever they may be, these things just have to work, and they have to work in extreme environments. Soldiers don't have time to maintain them, and so the challenges there around the engineering problems attract some of the best and brightest engineering talent because it's really fun to work on that stuff. So this is Ava. Ava is an advanced technology demonstrator, really trying to, to pull together the, the best things that we've done in our government division, as well as on the consumer side with the floor care robots, and pulling that together with some advances in technology. Ava is about autonomous mobility. Ava is capable of mapping the environment she's in, understanding where she is in that environment, and then moving from point A to point B in that space without running into people or things. And, you know, the behavior is all at the app level. We all looked at the iPad, which the folks that were making it had thousands of good ideas for it, but they weren't the ones who came up with the Angry Birds idea, for instance, right? Uh, so we really have a belief that if we can make this cost effective enough to get it out into people's hands, that there's some app that will sell lots of these robots that none of us will think of. It'll be some third-party developer. You'll see right here, this sensor on Ava is made by a company called PrimeSense. So it's not the exact same model as what's in the Kinect, but it's very similar. So much more cost-effective solution than the very expensive military-grade sensors we were using beforehand. We see lots of opportunities in the healthcare markets. The doctors able to remotely diagnose, uh, for instance, a stroke, uh, which is a very time-critical thing to address. Uh, you know, if you have a stroke in a rural area and you get taken to a rural hospital, an expert neurologist from a huge hospital hours away can uh, diagnose and treat you for that stroke without the hour-long ambulance ride in between. We're here with Craig Enrickson. Um, you are you're the scuba guy. Exactly. Uh, we're here in we're here in a sort of it's kind of a like a museum of the history of my robot. Uh, but this is your this is your territory over here. We've got the Roomba. We've got the scuba. Can you can you take us on a, a brief tour of the product lines? We'll start here with our Roomba. You're looking at the most recent uh, entrant to the to the Roomba lineup. This is our brand new 700 series. We use an adaptive algorithm. We call it iAdapt. It's a really uh, clever algorithm. It makes sure it runs around the room, does its job, and doesn't uh, damage the environment. It's one of these things where if you step in front of it, 
and it runs into your foot. Mm -hmm. You know, it has a number of sensors that we call it light touch uh, sensing, but it'll sort of slow down and gently nudge you so it knows the difference between, say, a uh, bed sheet and sure. your foot. You took care of something that people didn't want to do around the home. Right. Nobody really likes sweeping. People like mopping even less, right? This is exactly <laughs> right, yes. So scuba was exciting for us, too. It's a new entrance. This, this launched in 2005. Mm -hmm. So you fill this up with water, but then it puts water down. It scrubs the floor with a spinning brush, and then we use this squeegee to pick up all that dirty water and store it back inside the robot. This is the new one right here. This is brand new. Yeah, this is uh, literally, we're just launching this. This is the brand new Scuba 390. This is better all around. It's better performing. It does the same job, but just does it better. We've improved battery life. We've improved a number of things, and we're excited about this evolving the, the large Scuba as well. Mm -hmm. All right, Craig, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to go outside and check out something a little bit different. We're moving from uh, picking up trash to something a, a bit more dangerous. We're with Tom Grimalia, VP of iRobot. We're in kind of an annex area, just outside of the office building. We're standing in a rock pit. What is this place around us? Well, this is our test and demonstration facility. Uh, outside here, you can see a variety of obstacles that we use to uh, test our products and to yeah. demonstrate our products for customers. This is where all the fun happens. This here. is where the fun happens, yeah. exactly. And we can't ignore this guy right in front of us. Who is this? This is called the Warrior. They're used by uh, military forces in the U.S. Uh, and around the world. They're also used by uh, uh, police forces around the world. It's a true multi-mission robot. We can reach 11 and a half feet in the air. We can go under vehicle and extend it you know, 8, 9, 10 feet yeah. outward. Everything you need is right here in front of you. You need a laptop, mm -hmm. PlayStation controller, <laughs> robot, you're good yeah. to go. Uh, what's the reasoning behind that? Why are we using a PlayStation controller for this robot? It's really simple to pick up and learn. You can train yeah. yourself in minutes and be ready to go. All right, so what, what is this we're looking over here in its claws? This is, this is, this is pretty ominous. Sure. Uh, in the warrior's claws, that's called a uh, 155 shell, okay. which is uh, a device used uh, for explosives in Afghanistan, commonly used to uh, inflict great harm on our soldiers or those of our allies and partners. That's the, that's the IED that we hear That's so the about. IED, yes. Yeah. So uh, this is a very commonly used one. This one weighs about 95 pounds, mm -hmm. uh, so the warrior can lift it with, with no problem. It can go up to a maximum of 220 pounds. Well, it's been an awesome day. Uh, we picked up some IEDs with the warrior robot. Uh, we got to throw the first look around, check out the new scuba, Talk to some really smart people about robots. Thanks to iRobot, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us. We're back, and uh, we've got one of those creations that's going around uh, on the floor. It's the scuba. It's giving some people a free shoe shine tonight, I think, actually, and attacking our camera. Oh, we've got the first look with Jen up here as well. Uh, Oh, wow, this is getting crazy. Got There's too many too robots. Many robots. Uh, I never thought I would say we have too many robots on the show right now. <laughs> They've got a mind of their own. Uh, yeah, let's get this guy going again. So that's the Scuba 390. This is the first Slick 110. Uh, I mean, this is really, we, we looked at the Warrior Bot. It's like a 400-pound robot. It was climbing over walls. But like in a weird way, I kind of enjoy playing with this one the most. Yeah. Um, you just you huck it like a Frisbee. So it does very reconnaissance for you. Non-aerodynamic. It's incredibly frisbee. well. It's a frisbee that's meant to break through windows. True. Okay. Um, you know, so you can go uh, be around the corner and you know check out the situation over there. Um, one of the really cool things uh, with this, I mean, this had a controller about yay big with an LCD on it, so you could actually view from all angles. It's got a, a camera. Um, it's got a camera in the front right there, one in the rear, and then one on either side between the treads. Um, and it's basically like a big video game controller, which was the same with the Warrior. I mean, it was, it was a Logitech PlayStation 3 controller. So really, so third like... third-party, non -like, The ones that third party, Well, the military, you know, I mean, if you're buying things to the military, that Logitech controller is like $300. Oh, that's true. So go yeah, off brand. If Everything gets overpriced for the government. Um, um, unfortunately, but, we weren't able to get the controller yeah, for this guy. But you can still... Do you want to play with... You yeah, I want to do that again, because that's pretty cool. Uh, so it's got these wings on it. You know, if you... Oh, boy. Oh, God. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. If you, if you, you know, again, if you, like, hook it through a window, it ends up upside down, or if it goes down a flight of stairs, it can right itself using those guys. Uh, the scuba, though, if it goes down a flight of stairs, unfortunately... Is out of trouble. It is in trouble, but we've got a little invisible wall right there that's, uh, that's keeping it off the carpet. Uh, so the scuba is brand new. This is out now. Sadly, you can't buy any of the military products. Because no, I really want one of these Indirectly, things. we paid for these. The government just had a, a couple million dollar deal to buy a lot of these things. So go 
So if you're in Afghanistan, demand to play with one of those because you absolutely. you pay you for it. Worth, you are worth it, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, man. Yeah, and and if you've played any video games at all, it'll be pretty easy to control. Because, uh, you know, basically we're training people at home right now. You're playing your video games. You can go out in the field and control one of these guys. Careful. If it falls in love with you, you can take it home. That's the rule. <laughs> if you send it away and it comes back to you, that's how you really know that your scuba loves you. Thanks, Sting. Okay, so I think it's time now to make a trip to Europe for yeah. Mobile World Congress. Barcelona. Barcelona, Spain. Uh, Mobile World Congress is increasingly one of the biggest shows of the year. Not quite CES big, but maybe in a couple of years it will be. Uh, we checked out a lot of smartphones, a lot of tablets, and we've got some highlights for you now. Hi, it's Matt and Shona Engadget, and we're here in Barcelona for Mobile World Congress 2012. All the major phone networks are here. There's lots of stuff to see. So let's go check it out. One of the features of the HTC One S is its ability to take high-speed photos. So here, we'll, we'll give it a shot with the dancers. While I'm holding down the shutter button, the camera's taking continuous pictures at about every 0.7 of a second, so we end up with almost a film-like reel of images. So once we let go, we get back to this slideshow view, effectively. Really in focus still, the colors are great. The number of pictures I took could actually create a film. HTC is highlighting its partnership with Beats, and they have a sound booth to let us do that. So here's the HTC One S, so what I'll do is I'll play it, we'll listen to it without Beats enabled, and then I'll enable Beats and you'll hear a difference in the sound quality. So that's the track with Beats disabled, and now I'm going to enable it. Just by enabling the Beats audio itself, the volume and the bass and the music came up quite a bit. So we're here at the Nokia booth. So... So here we're in the futures area of the Nokia booth. They're showing off some of the technologies that they're working on. And so the, one of the areas is uh, nano coatings. This is a hydrophobic coating right here. So this is kind of the more traditional kind of coating. And if you drop some water on it, it repels it a little bit. This here is a super hydrophobic. And watch what happens when I uh, drop the water on there. It's literally bouncing and trying to get right off of that surface. They have this graphene-based material here that is going to be used in future phones. And so we'll have to be able to have phones that are perfectly flexible, like this uh, little sample. Imagine you can do this with your phone. We're here at Intel's booth. Now, one of the big things here is the React table. Now, it kind of works like a DJ table using cubes and other units to kind of modulate sound and uh, create new music. And it works a lot better than it sounds. So we're going to give it a go, and hopefully I'll find a second career once I get fired from Engadget. So let's go take a look. I'm here with Carlos. So Carlos, could you explain a bit about how this all works? These chains are like barcodes, and when you put a piece over, a camera below recognizes which shape is this. If you don't have any square object on the table, it doesn't make any sound. When you put the square object, go through. This is the volume for each piece. And uh, twisting, you, you change the frequency, and also you, you can cut the sound. This is, the master, this is master volume, for example. Do you mind if I uh, have a go myself? Have a play? Sure. So now we're just going to go a bit crazy. I'm no pro here. There we go. Ah. <laughs> bravo! Bravo! So that's it, Mobile World Congress 2012 is a wrap. And I'm tired, but I had a lot of fun. I think I had a lot of fun too, but I'll agree with you, we've done a lot here. There's plenty to check out on Engadget.com, plenty of videos, plenty of posts to read. So we'll see you in 2013, because we're going to be doing it all over again. So we'll see you then. All right, welcome back. I always have a hard time saying Mobile World Congress. I don't know why Mo that is. MWC. MWC, yep. that's, the, that's the way I guess I should say it.
You say Barcelona so beautifully. Barcelona. Right? Barcelona. Oh, thanks very much. Say uh, Douglas Rushkoff. Douglas Rushkoff. Thank you for joining us. This is Hi, Douglas, for Douglas Rushkoff. Boy, yeah. I did better the first time. Mm, uh, I was kept with that. author and uh, expert on technology and media, and we're honored to have you here with us tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about me. a couple of your books. First being uh, Adolescent Demo Division ADD. This is a comic book that's kind of like a it's graphic novel. Excuse me, <laughs> graphic novel. It's like a dystopian future where gamers are like rock stars, but there's like a dark undercurrent going yeah, on. Yeah, I don't know if it's a dystopian future or just this kind of a, a balanced view of the present. Uh, you know, okay. I mean, the a balanced view of our dystopian <laughs> present. <laughs> well, depending on your perspective. I mean, some people would think a world where, where video gamers are rock stars and, uh, is, is, would be a good thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a world very much like our own. I mean, the only real difference is that the the kind of the, the shopping mall reality um, in which we live is really explicit. It's these kids who live in a, basically in a shopping mall that is this uh, game testing facility and they have a reality show about them. So sort of all the different things about our media kind of all compressed onto these kids who are raised from really the gamete stage to be video game testers. And we, you know, find out, you know, as the story goes on, what that's really about, you know, that, it's, that it has a lot more to do with looking at at how young people uh, learn to resist certain kinds of media manipulation and then trying to figure out how to mitigate that resistance. It's kind of a, about the arms race between human awareness and our, our would-be controllers. It's an interesting twist from today's status where we do have professional gamers who are quite well known, but then we also have a lot of game testers who are you know, locked in a closet and spend all day trying to break level 1A of the latest Super Mario game. Uh, so you're basically taking those two positions and bringing them together into something that is, in the book anyway, famous and, and esteemed and, and well-known. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It was sort of two things inspired this, this book. First, it was way back in around 1995 when Wired Magazine came out with this article about um, the attention economy. You know, they basically said, oh, well, now we have infinite media real estate, but the one limiting factor is, is eyeball hours. You know, we're living in an attention economy and we're going to have to get attention. Then all these companies came out with like new stickiness routines to get more eyeball hours. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, do you really want to go to a website and experience stickiness and get stuck? In your just, eyeballs. Uh, yeah. You don't want stickiness in your eyeballs. <laughs> no, it didn't make sense. And then I started to see Ritalin prescriptions go up and attention uh, deficit disorder. Yeah. You can diagnose it's like, oh, we're in an attention economy. And now we have attention deficit disorder, which is what? Which is kids not willing to pay attention to marketing. Like, is that a disease or is that resistance? Is that an adaptive trait? You know, what, what is that? So sort of that was going on. At the same time, all those articles were coming out. Remember when Electronic Arts had all these kids complaining that they were being, yeah. you know, that they had the idea of beautiful job of being a vid game tester, but uh -huh. they were all being worked into oblivion and taking tears, Adderall yes. and God knows what. So it was sort of those two things. I was like, what's happening here? Because on the one hand, games is the future. I mean, homo ludens, you know, the, I, I'm into the playability of stock market, playability of the economy, playability of the government. But on the other hand, when, when playability is kind of turned around into this gamification thing, oh, we're going to gamify this. And it's like all of a sudden we're doing things for badges to get on Facebook to get this to. It's like, wait a minute, it kind of turned. So is there a solution? The solution? <laughs> Read my book. <laughs> program yeah. or be programmed. I mean, I think the solution is the same as it's always been. Know what the heck is going on. You know, to understand that the tools you're using, the software you're using, the operating systems on which you are living your life are biased. These are not neutral. These are written by people with agendas. Some of them are good people with good agendas. Some of them are good people who are being forced to use bad agendas. And some of them are just bad people with bad agendas. But if you don't understand this media, if you take it for granted, if you think Facebook is really just there to help you make friends, then you need to educate yourself a little bit more about who and what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, we, a very specific example is we just had those uh, the iRobot robots on earlier, and uh, one, of, one of the things about them is that they use these gaming controllers. So you're kind of learning at home how to use these military robots. I mean, is that... Is that one of the, the avenues that we're seeing here? I mean, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of military games out there right now. Are, are people basically training to be members of the military at home? Well, sure. Um, you know, but that's, you know, what was football? What was Boy Scouts? I mean, that's sort of always the way that goes. It, it, it's, it's the new landscape of, of war. It's, in some ways, it, it worries me less that 
uh, kids would would train, you know, with video games for this sort of Ender's Game uh, like scenario where now we're all, you know, the, the, the last starfighter um, able to to beat up bad people with our joysticks. Then the way that that the army and the military kind of equate video game playing with joining the military. When you look at in Pennsylvania in the, in the mall, they'll have a recruitment st center, which is no longer a marine sitting behind a desk telling you about the army. It's video game consoles where you get to play video games and while you're playing it you know the marine comes up and say enjoying yourself <laughs> son <laughs> you know i got a drone you can fly um that's the part that gets a little uh, iffy now what is your take on google's recent privacy changes because there's been a lot of reaction on either sides google basically brought together all the services so they can track you not only as you're web surfing or doing email but kind of bring it all together is that tying into this as well well the thing that's the, the thing that's all good about this is that now, even regular people understand. In other words, that the, the thing that's good is that it's, it's the, the opacity is transparent. You know, now, at least we know what we don't know, and we know what they might know. So now, all of a sudden, regular people can say, huh. Just the fact that people got upset about it and talked about it online is, is a and good thing. People are becoming aware of it. When you look at you know, Ellie Pariser's book, um, Filter Bubble, the thing that's scary about that is when you find out that, oh, you mean my Google search results are different from his or different from his? And there's no way to really even know what they're cutting out or what they're, huh. When you don't know what's not there, it's sort of a little bit more scary that now that you understand the way these algorithms work or something about them, people can go, well, now I have a choice. Now I, I have some, I, some ability. I'm wondering if people are understanding that or whether this is just kind of outrage. And I wonder if they're getting outrage overload in the same way they're getting information overload. Yeah, well, you know, the interesting thing is people on the net, the net is very good for being outraged about things that happen on the net. Mm -hmm. You know, we're really good. You know, I remember the first big internet political action was when people were upset about getting uh, busy signals when they're dialed <laughs> up on AOL. Remember, it was like the big internet story. So, you know, we have outrage about that. But I think as people realize that everything they do online, every email they send, every SMS, every digital conversation, that stuff may as well be chiseled on the side of the Parthenon in terms of how long that's there. And when you look at companies like Opera that are learning to do big data mining, to do predictive, uh, uh, you know, predictive modeling on your behavior, you realize, oh my God, everything you do in this space is there forever, and it's going to be as easily searchable as you know one piece of text is now. But you're on you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook. I mean, this, your solution isn't get off of these things. No, my solution is be knowledgeable about it. I mean, I've never been anonymous online because I've known there's actually no such thing. You know, there's the illusion of anonymity, but eventually it's going to all come back to you. Nice guy Fox Max, and then, yeah, but even know. then, you know, even they they'll find you eventually. Um, and and, and it's to, the part that bothers me is it's really it's this predictive modeling stuff. You know, when you know that there's 13 year old kids now on Facebook who don't know they're going to be gay when they're 17. But that there's marketers who do know that they're going to be gay when they're 17. It's like, what is that? So once you start seeing, you know, uh, ads for makeup and dresses online, maybe you should question who you are as a person. Well, or will you? Or what behaviors will it exacerbate? What are they trying to promote? Does seeing all the ads that are supposed to be there for the person you're about to be make you more that person than you would have been otherwise? Um, it's 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 that if you come to understand that the interactive environment is interactive and that it is basically thousands of salespeople trying to do whatever they can to you and your environment to make you buy more of their stuff and to feel worse about yourself, then you'll think, okay, I'll go online and I'll use this, but if I'm aware of that, it's a little bit like having the, the, they, live gla you know, the they live glasses <laughs> on. You know, it's like, okay, but this is not a safe space, right? This is not a real world. These You're are not my friends. You have vampires when you have the glasses on. Right. Who wants to do that? Who does? I don't. I don't. But you know, the more you know about the environment you're in, the more you have a choice to choose environments that are less like that. The more you could choose to be on diaspora of the equivalent instead of Facebook, the more you can decide, oh my gosh, you mean having a hard I could have a hard drive instead of use the cloud? You mean you can store your own data? Wow. 
you know, For it's now. not such a big deal. Do you do that? Are you are you storing everything locally in, in the way that people are like have water in their basement in case of the upcoming Well, it's apocalypse? odd to think, oh my God, keeping my own files is so so old fashioned. Yeah. You're keeping It's your like own? a bag of rice and then a hard drive on top of that, right? <laughs> no, I'm in both. I mean, I, I for some reason, I kind of trust the Dropbox people right now. I just, I've got no beef. I got no beef with them. They don't. They don't. They haven't rubbed me the wrong way. So cool got, Dropbox. Yeah, I got my stuff up there, yeah. and uh, I saw him on one of these kind of things. I don't know, a podcast. I was like, oh, he seems okay to me. <laughs> it's like you know, one of my yeah. trusting some old ancient caveman instinct about their their goodness. But um, I got that, and I have a hard drive. I mean, I just it feel like you know having a hard drive is almost like it's being that fucking freaking Unabomber or something. Yeah. It's like I'm out in my cabin with my hard drive, keeping my own data for the apocalypse. It's like it's going to be really useful after the EMP anyway, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you, not, you can use it for kindling. It'll, I still got my old yeah. email. Yeah. On that dire note, uh, depressing note, I think we'll, uh, we'll call this interview too close. Uh, thank you, Douglas, for joining us. Uh, your uh, books. Yeah, we've got one more thing, actually. What's that? Yeah. John or. Oh. So, uh, so Tim, it's Tim's oh. birthday oh. on Sunday. <laughs> um, Thanks, buddy. We. Wow. We didn't. We don't have enough money Can in our budget to actually sing you happy birthday. Or get candles, apparently. Or can, we, we don't have the proper fire codes to, to give you candles. Tim is actually 102, and it would have set off a, a big inferno. I, I am the vampire that you can see with the glasses on. Don't put the glasses on, people. Uh, but I, you know, on behalf of, we've got uh, several staff members here. I mean, it's been, uh, it's been a hell of a year, Tim. We've gone through it. It's, it's been, I think, roughly about a, a year since we, a we first uh, started doing this. Um, and you have, you've been a rock. Thank you. I appreciate it. You've that. been a lovely bearded rock. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to Tim. Sure. Thanks to Douglas. Yeah. Thank you. And, and uh, Douglas's books, AD or Program or Be Programmed, are available now. Happy birthday. Keep them as a gift. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> <Sign these later. laughs> we also want to thank uh, Sky Combat Ace for giving us the opportunity to dogfight and vomit all over their planes earlier tonight. And, of course, thank AT&T for bringing us here tonight. I hope you all enjoyed the show. We'll be back next month with another episode. <laughs> yeah, let's just dive right in here. This is That's monthly? great. Yeah. Yeah. Weekly, weekly. We do we do the podcast weekly, but oh. it's just it's like all this pre-production.